Welcome to Madison Church Online. I'm Stephen Faith, lead pastor. And um, as I was just talking about, the last few months we've been in a couple different series aimed at helping your faith grow up, helping you spiritually mature, because oftentimes we grow up and our faith doesn't. Like physically, you have no choice but to grow up. As a kid, you get taller, and as an adult, you get wider, and or you get grayer, or you get balder. I mean, you have no choice but to physically change. Emotionally, you go through changes. You get more mature. Some of us, we've stayed in our middle school maturity, but it's a fight every day to stay there. But we grow up mature uh, emotionally, But when it comes to spiritually, that is not granted. As a matter of fact, it takes a lot of work to keep up your spiritual growth. And so we've been mostly talking about the Bible and prayer because in our faith, those tend to be the two areas that we lean on the most, and rightfully so. When it comes to growing spiritually, I can't think of two better habits and disciplines in your own life than reading the Bible and praying. Okay, but those are also the areas that tend to stay immature. I mean, it's stays immature. A lot of you have opinions on things like free will or predestination, and it's like deep and it's wide. But then at the same time, when we're talking about some very basic things about prayer in the Bible, there's just a lot of illiteracy or there's a lot of confusion. And so throughout this series, it's just been trying to like, let's all just go on a journey together. Let's deconstruct some things. Let's learn some things. And by the time this series is over, we should all be better off for it. As children, we're taught basic prayers that rhyme with like, they're like nursery rhymes and they're basic and you got to start somewhere. And so while I kind of have been knocking on that a little bit, I want to continue to acknowledge you have to start somewhere. It's just unfortunate that for a lot of us, that's still where we're at. We're still on the memorized prayer that we learned back in the nursery and they don't hold up to real life problems, do they? Those little nursery rhymes that we've been talking about. Uh, <clears throat> There's a trauma all of a sudden in your life. The nursery rhymes don't help then. As you get older, you develop a chronic illness, or maybe you had a chronic illness you were born with. Those little nursery rhyme prayers don't help then. There's the death of a dream. Is there like a worse sting than the death of a dream? Something that you hoped for, worked for, and it is like by far not possible anymore. It's just gone. If there is something worse than the death of a dream, it'd be the loss of something you lived for. The loss of something that you live for, and what's worse than that is the loss of someone you loved more than life itself. And when these things happen to us, and they will eventually happen to all of us, if you are not there now, you will get there. And if you've been there before, you you know inevitably you will get there again. Our faith gets hurt because we're ill-equipped to deal with it. Because those nursery rhymes were meant to help us when the biggest concern of our day was having good dreams tonight. But as we become adults, having nightmares and good dreams, that really gets low on the list of priorities to us. And then when our faith gets hurt, how we view ourselves often becomes a casualty as well. We view ourselves, maybe I'm not spiritual enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm bad. I got sin in my life I need to deal with. And then as a result, our relationship with God gets hurt. Now, I'm a believer that most people, if not all people, pray from time to time. There's a situation that comes up. I've heard of atheists who talk and they say, well, sometimes I just accidentally pray, but then they say, well, I'm not praying. I'm just kind of thinking thoughts. But I think most of us pray. And a lot of times I think that they're very little prayers. I don't want to get pulled over. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. I don't want to get caught by my dad. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. Uh, Favor for the test you didn't prepare for. Parking spot close to the store on those rainy, sleety days like today. You're like, please let me have a parking spot right in front of the church. Uh, Our favorite sports teams to win the big game we pray. And so whoever's praying for the 49ers to beat the Packers, I'm begging you, please stop. Because God hears your prayers more than mine. And so you got to stop. And then there are the big and serious prayers though, right? You pray for your adult child who has abandoned their faith to find their faith again or to find a faith that they can resonate with and walk into. You ask God to help you restore your marriage. God, it's broken. I don't know what else to do. The therapy doesn't work. Nothing works. God, will you help me? And you plead, you beg with God, bodily healing from this chronic illness, whatever I'm going through. And it's when these prayers go unanswered that our faith stings the most. It's not the little prayers, but these 
big ones. And we all have unanswered prayers in our lives. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Because when we have unanswered prayers, not only does it hurt, but I bet there's someone in your life you know who's walked away from faith. They've abandoned God altogether because of unanswered prayers, the weight of unanswered prayers, how they just keep compounding and adding up. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's unfair to say that you might be in the room right now or watching or listening online, and you might be there right now. You are very close to just giving up because of unanswered prayers. And what I hope and my goal, and I'm always trying to be transparent with you when I'm writing, what is my goal for this talk, is to help you with unanswered prayer. But I want to let you know that it's not to give you answers about unanswered prayer. I've done that before. We've sometimes talked about like how prayer is like a stoplight. And there's a red light when God says no. And there's a green light when God says yes. And there's the yellow light when God says wait. We've talked about things like why do bad things happen to good people? And we've talked about how, well, this is God's world and God has a will, but it's not the only will because there's God's war and there's spiritual warfare. We've talked about that. We're not going to talk about that today. I want to talk to you about what happens when your prayers aren't being answered and God is silent. I want to talk to you about when your prayers aren't being answered and you can't see God. I want to talk to you when your prayers aren't being answered and you come here and you expect to experience God and you hear me praying that, that we're here and we're experiencing God, but you don't. That's what I want to talk to you about today. But you know what's ironic about talking about this? We're not honest about it. Like, we're not honest. And it seems like the more spiritually mature you are, the more you lie about unanswered prayer. It's going to be okay. You just got to have faith. God is working. I'm totally content with the yellow light. It's just like, you're lying. It sucks. It hurts. It's keeping you awake in the middle of the night. Why can't we talk about that? And it's not an issue of faith. Because in the Bible, the writers of the Bible, Old and New Testament, they're honest about it. And they make no attempts to cover it up. They will let you know what's going on. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, Elijah prays that God would kill him. He's suicidal. He has suicidal ideation. God Take me out. I know some of you have prayed that. David prays fervently for a child's life. His child, one of his children is sick, and he prays and he prays and he prays, and everyone's praying. David, a man after God's own heart. And the child dies. Any of you who have experienced that loss or a miscarriage, you know what David is feeling. Jeremiah flat out accuses God of hiding. Are you there right now? You're like, God, I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying. Why are you withholding yourself from me? Jeremiah just straight up asked God, why are you hiding? Jesus prays for the unity of his followers. And we know that's not happening. That is a 2,000-year-old unanswered prayer that the sinless son of God himself prayed. And there's no doubt grieving today that his church is not united. We are not united. And the closer we get to that second or first Tuesday in November, the more it's going to become apparent just how divided we are. That is an unanswered prayer. And these instances are not presented with simple resolutions. Elijah prays, God, will you take me? It's not like there's a simple solution to that. It's not like David prays for his child that's died, and then all of a sudden, boom, a resurrection happens. Nobody's told Jesus, just have a little bit more faith, and your prayer will be answered. I imagine in the faith department, Jesus is probably pretty good. There are no easy answers, and the biblical writers are okay with that. They're okay laying out their grievances, their doubts, and their desperations. They don't feel the need to be optimistic or to sugarcoat the reality of their experiences like many of us do. Listen to the psalmist here go off on God. God, God, my God, why did you dump me miles from nowhere? Doubled up with pain. I call God all day long. No answer. Nothing. I keep at it all night, tossing and turning. And you, are you indifferent? Above it all, 
leaning back on the cushions of Israel's praise, at this point, I would start walking away from this guy because he's probably going to get struck by lightning, right? He's calling out God. And he says, we know you were there for our parents. They cried out for your help and you gave it. They trusted you and they lived a good life. Let's break this psalm down right now. This is, you can relate to this. This might be the psalm you relate to the most out of every psalm that is written. God, I feel so alone. That's the first line of this. I feel so alone. God, why am I here? Some of you, it might be, why am I here? This stage of life that I'm in. Some of you might be literally asking, why Madison, Wisconsin? Why am I here? God, God, where are you? Where are you? God, how come you're silent? I'm awake at 3 a.m., worrying about my problems, begging you, God, to do something, and you don't seem like you care. You just don't seem to care. Are the only prayers you hear here the prayers of worship? The only time, God, you care is if I'm complimenting you. That's what the psalmist is asking. But when I come to you with my garbage, God, do you just not care anymore? God, I've seen you answer the prayers of others. Why not mine? I imagine many of you know exactly what this writer is saying. You might have prayed those prayers in the last 12 hours. We know what it's like to have unanswered prayer. And every single one of us in the room, if you've ever prayed a prayer, you've had a prayer unanswered. So why don't we talk about it as honestly as the writers of the Bible do? Spiritual maturity, growing up, mature prayer life and understanding of prayer means that we have to know how to navigate silence and to do so with faith and trust. And so if you want to follow along with me, I'm going to go to Mark 14. I'll have the words on the screen, but you can use your phones. You can use those Bibles around. You're going to Mark 14, where we find Jesus in the garden on Good Friday. This is a couple days before Easter, so we're about a week and a half early talking about it today. But this is where we find Jesus, and Jesus is in this moment, and he's just like you and me. As a matter of fact, in my book, I write that this is the time that I believe Jesus is most like you and me. Jesus did a lot of stuff in his life that you and I simply can't relate to. But in this scene, we're going to see Jesus is just like you and me. So picking up in verse 32, Last Supper has already come and gone. Judas is on his way to betray him. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took his three best friends, Peter, James, and John with him. And he became deeply troubled. And distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And this is what I mean on Jesus being super relatable right now. It's a Friday night. He is grieved. He is crushed. He's got one friend betraying him. He knows he's going to die. He's stressed out. He says, My soul is crushed. But I want to point out that Jesus did do something a lot of us do differently. Jesus is aware to some degree. I don't know to what degree. I don't think anyone can say with certainty to what degree what's about to transpire. But he knows to some degree it's not good. And instead of isolating himself, instead of going away by himself to pray in his prayer closet all alone, he takes his best friends. He takes his guys. He says, come with me. I'm hurting and I need you. When you find yourself in a hard place, when your prayers aren't, aren't being answered, do you choose to be vulnerable with those you love or do you choose to withdraw and isolate? Because part of having unanswered prayer and living with that is following Jesus as he dealt with unanswered prayer, or what will be an unanswered prayer. And Jesus brings his companions. You see, one of the things I think that we're like cursed with in North America in the 21st century is that we assume discipleship is knowledge. 
And I am convinced we know more about Greek culture than Peter, James, and John knew about their own culture. I'm convinced we do. The problem with our faith and when it gets stunted is not a knowledge issue. It is a follow issue. It is a doing issue. So when we're dealing with unanswered prayer, it's not up here. It's what did Jesus do? And so following Jesus, when it comes to unanswered prayer, means inviting your friends along with you. Following Jesus means not withdrawing. Following Jesus means not isolating. And you might be someone in here today, you're like, I'm I'm not very social. I'm kind of introverted. And when I'm alone, I need to be, or when I'm suffering, I need to be alone. And I would just say, that's what makes following Jesus hard. He says it's hard. He's not lying to you. He says it's hard. Why is it hard? Not because you have to pass a test, but because when you're hurting and your natural inclination is to isolate and withdraw, Jesus says, hold on, bring them with you. This is better for you. Might not feel better right now. He says, this is better for you. Now, I want to point something else out, too, about this. I think it's very, very important to do. Jesus is at the end of his life, his earthly life. And he's having this moment, and he says, I need my friends. He has not not reached out to them in weeks. He has not not seen them in months. Jesus has spent every day or most days with these people for years before he ever taps them and says, I need you now. And I want you to begin to think about that with your own relationships and your own health. If the only time you're ever reaching out to your people is when you're broken, you're at the end of your rope, you're at despair, we're also not following in the ways of Jesus. You see, this is a two-way street. I need to be able to tap you and say, I need help right now. But they need to be able to tap you and say, I need your help right now. And more times than not, yes, Peter needed Jesus' help more than Jesus needed Peter. But that's how this goes. We invest in relationships. That's what it means to follow in the way of Jesus. So then when we come up to a period, a season of unanswered prayer, we don't find ourselves alone or isolated or without help or without support because God knows, Jesus knows, for you and me, when we get to that point, dark, despair, unanswered prayer. He knows, and you know, because you know people just like this who have left their faith. He knows if you go at it alone, your faith just might become the casualty. And he has a vision for you, a long-term vision that includes unanswered prayer, which is where we're going next. Jesus continues. He went a little further. He fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. In Jesus' darkest moment, in which he realizes this prayer probably isn't going to be answered, and that's the reality as he goes further beyond this moment, it becomes more apparent this prayer isn't going to be answered. Jesus chooses to go further into prayer. Remember, we've already told he's grief stricken. He's already told his guys, I am being crushed right now. And instead of walking away from prayer, Jesus doubles down. I think for a lot of us, when we go through a difficult time, we're going through a difficult season and really serious things. I'm not trying to make light of that at all. When we're going through really hard things, I think we isolate. Jesus says, don't do that. But I think we kind of give up on prayer. I think we do two things with prayer. I think we pray right away. God, take it away. Okay, God's not going to take it away. And then I'm going to do everything myself, exhaust all of my options. And then if that doesn't work, then fine, I'll go back to prayer as my last resort again. But we see what happens is when Jesus is going through the thick of it, he doubles down on prayer. He goes back to God. So when we're going through unanswered prayer, we need people, but we also can't quit on prayer. And he's asking for God to do something. I like how, you know, whether it's the Lord's prayer or this prayer, we're like, we're telling God, God, remember, you can do all things. Like God needs the reminder that he can do all things. But he's, he, what he's doing, I think, is expressing that God is powerful and he can do all things. And maybe that was more for Jesus than it was for God. But what happens when you and I go through a dark time, an unanswered time? Do we not begin to doubt like the psalmist did? God, where are you? God, can't you do this? Jesus is showing us, hey, in those moments, it is really easy to doubt God's power. Just say, get it. Remind yourself that God can do all things. Reassure yourself that God can do all things. 
What I love about this next part, though, is up until this point, Jesus is completely relatable to you and me. Bad time, going through unanswered prayer. He says, God, I don't want to do this. God, don't let me do this. You've prayed that, right? God, I don't want to do this. God, don't make me do this. Here's where Jesus and you and me, like, we take different turns here. Jesus says, but I want your will ultimately to be done and not my own. And I think a lot of us are just going to be honest and we're saying, nope, nope. Nope, 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 nope. Don't want your will. God, you could tell me what your will is. Let me make an executive decision. Look at your will, look at my will, compare them, pros and cons. I'll think about it. I'll even pray about it. But God, I want to know what my options are. But Jesus offers surrender. It's the surrender of his will. And so when you're going through these seasons of unanswered prayer, we need people and our support system. We need to double down on prayer. We need to remind ourselves of God's great power. And finally, we need to surrender. When we're asking those questions, God, where are you? God, where am I? God, why aren't you listening? We need to remember, but not my will, your will. Week one of the series, everyone was like, yeah, we pray for relationship with God. I know I got good feedback from you. Everyone was a very positive message, right? Uplifting. Yeah, we need relationship and we need God's will. And then we get to the end of the series. We're talking about unanswered prayer. And we're like, you know, I don't think that week one was that great. I don't know if that's why I should pray anymore for God's will to be done. But that's it. Throughout the series, we've said that a theology of prayer is rooted and seeks first and foremost God's will and an ever-growing relationship with him. And if that's true, if I still kind of have you on the hook for believing that, I want to kind of offer a little bit of an explanation as to why you might be going through a season of unanswered prayer. Not answers, but I want to kind of provide maybe some clarity. I think a lot of times the temptation is to run, to give up when our prayers aren't being answered, to find answers other places. Jesus acknowledges himself. That's how we feel. He says, he tells uh, his friends, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. Your spirit is willing, but your body is weak. He says, I know you want to do this. He's like, but I also know you're kind of a slacker. And so I need you to be conscious of this and, and devote yourself to prayer. Jesus acknowledges it's going to be hard to push through, but Jesus is not an enabler. Jesus is not going to say, just take the path of least resistance. Just do whatever feels good. Jesus is going to challenge us to step up and to do hard things. I'm not speaking as of just someone who's like studied this. I'll only answer prayer, something Megan and I deal with um, every day since we've moved here. Before we moved here, uh, she was teaching and was offered teaching jobs in Springfield, Missouri. That's her calling. That's what she wants to do. It's kind of funny. When um, when we started dating, I was going to go and be a therapist or a counselor. And then I remember talking to her before we got engaged, saying, hey, I feel like I'm actually being called into ministry, maybe be a pastor, probably a church planter. I'm going to make absolutely no money the rest of my life. There's no benefits. There's no retirement. If you want out, I totally accept that. And and she said, I will never find anyone better than you. And no, that's, that's not what she said. <laughs> but we did get married. So obviously she was, she was with it. But we felt like, we, we both felt this way, that Madison, Wisconsin was where we were called to be. And so I guess we just assumed that like you got a bunch of teaching job offers in Missouri. We would just move up here and you would get some. And then it didn't happen. And then it didn't happen. And years have gone by. We've been here now 10 years. And it hasn't happened. We've tried everything. I mean, we've prayed. We've, we've fasted. We've asked you to pray with us. We've, we've all prayed. We've, we've done everything. New resumes. We've, we've reached out to people. She's switched jobs, got more experience, more diverse experience. And we keep praying. And we keep praying. Now, I know that she's disappointed and heartbroken. Now, let me tell you that me, her husband, on the other hand, I've also made this offer. Let's leave. I don't want you to be stuck in Madison, sacrificing your ambitions, your calling, your career, because God led us here. If God's not going to answer the prayer, guess what? I, I can. And you might think I'm being arrogant. No, I really can. My friend who lives in Las Vegas, they're paying teachers to move to Vegas. They cover your moving. They'll help you with a down payment. They'll give you a job tomorrow. You see, I can answer that prayer, God. I can do it right now. Where do you want to work? Well, great. We'll just move to Vegas. We'll move anywhere else you want to get a job. That's my heart. Like, God, we moved here for you. 
This is an unanswered prayer. Why is it happening? I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't have any fluffy answers. I don't want to hear the God's world, God's war conversation. This is a freaking job we're talking about here. Why isn't it happening? I don't know. And you'll appreciate that Megan, in her faithfulness, says, no, God called us here. We'll stay. And that just frustrates me even more. I'm like, God, she's here. Like, why don't you answer this prayer? God, I've seen all that you can do. I have faith. I teach people about prayer. I teach people about unanswered prayer. Can't you do me a solid? And at this point, can I just be shallow with you? You guys know I'm pragmatic, right? Can I just tell you the lost income over 10 years of her not having a teaching job? One year is not a big deal. 10 years, we've lost out on $100,000. That's a tenth, at least a $10,000. I'm like, look at the money we lost. Look, I already mentioned I don't have retirement. I'm getting old. I'm not that old yet, but I'm like, we need some retirement here. We've lost out on 10 years of retirement. And Megan will be like, don't be shallow. Actually, she called me out on that at our small group the other night because they were talking about her getting this job. And she's like, yeah, you know, I just really like working with the kids and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, the money. And she was like, no, that's not it at all. I saw him just like, ah, she's so pure, God. Why don't you answer her prayer? Why are you answering mine? This is real to me. This is real to us. This isn't like an unanswered prayer we forget about. This is a prayer that she probably thinks about every time she punches in and punches out every day. This is a prayer that every time we're doing our monthly budget, we think about. That's this unanswered prayer. How have we been able to now last 10 years? Good friends. Good friends in Madison. Good companions. A good faith community. A good church. We haven't isolated ourselves. We've told you about our struggles and you've rallied around us. We've doubled down on prayer. When we get... we. This has been true of us since we've got married. When we get pissed off at God, we double down on prayer. It's our bad attitude. It really is. We're not just going to like walk away quietly. We're writing management, okay? And so that's what we do. And we're believing that at some point, this season, this long season is going to make sense. We're believing it. It doesn't feel like it. There's a lot of animosity right now for me. This This is me and God. We have a sore subject here. But I know it's going to make sense someday. I know he's doing something. And I just keep the faith and I keep praying. Not my will, but your will. This message of unanswered prayer is deeply challenging because of the culture around us. When you've hit a drought, your friends and family, whether they're church-going people or not, they're going to say, you must be doing something wrong. Have you read this book? Have you listened to this podcast? Have you talked to a therapist? Have you seen a doctor? And look, hey, I'm not against any of those things. We've talked about those things a lot. I recommend books all the time. But sometimes the world around us, they just don't accept that you might be going through an unanswered prayer because God loves you and God cares about you. Think about the Old Testament story of Job. I won't read any of it, but I do got a picture of Job here. If you guys remember Job from the Old Testament, uh, loses his wife, loses all of his kids, loses all of his income. I mean, he loses everything. And then his three friends who are very spiritual people and love Job, they come to him. And the entire story is these three friends who are well-intended are telling Job, you must have done something wrong, bud. We're here to help you figure that out. And once we figure it out, God is going to bless you again. And then they say, you know what? Your kids must have done something wrong, and that's why they all died. We're here to help you out. And Job is pretty convinced he didn't. Job keeps going back, no, 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 I'm pretty sure I've been faithful. I'm pretty sure I've been stuck to it. And this is like what the culture around us does. They sit by us and they say, well, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? Well intended, but they want to rush us through unanswered prayer seasons. And I want you, if you're in a season of unanswered prayer, to stop and to slow down and to look around. Pete Gregg in his book, God on Mute, he says, how very fragile our faith must be if we just can't remain sad, scared, confused, and doubting for a while. He says, your faith is pretty broken if the minute an unanswered prayer just completely scares you off. If you can't be sad, that's not a strong faith. Pete, actually, he begins to go and unpack, and he goes hard. He's like, you know, it's easy to love God and have faith when your prayers are getting answered. When you go to church and you can feel God's presence, easy then. When you like do a little scratch off lottery and you win a hundred bucks, you're like, oh, praise God then. But Pete says, boy, how many of us, the minute something goes wrong, we just bail. 
And what Pete argues is maybe you're going through a season of unanswered prayer because God's investing in you. Because you don't get credit for loving God when it's easy. But character is formed when loving God is difficult. Nicky Gumbel does the Alpha Course. He says, this is a sign of Christian maturity. When we continue to believe in God's love, even when we don't see it or feel it. We believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. We continue to believe in God's love, even in times of darkness, when we don't feel his love. See, a lot of us, we think we've, we've, got, we've got it all together. We're, we're trying to keep it all together. Because we think that if we're broken, God can't use us. We idolize perfection. I can't be imperfect. I can't make a mistake. That rules me out from God. Or worse yet, what if I get canceled in our culture? We try to be perfect. And then we break, right? It happens. Whether you drop it, or you drop it, or you come up to me and you force it, it drops and it breaks, and all of the pieces are there. And because we live in 2024, the 21st century, it's probably already on Instagram. And everyone can see our brokenness, and we think, well, it's over. Unanswered season of life, I'm broken. Have you ever heard of Kintsugi? You raise your hand if you've heard of this. I just heard about this preparing for this message a couple weeks ago. This is traditional Japanese art. It's about repairing broken pottery. This is absolutely amazing. They don't just super glue it like, you know, mom and dad did when you broke a toy, you got the super glue and it's clear because you don't want to see how your toy is broken. This is a philosophy. These Japanese artists and this culture, it's actually a philosophy that we're not going to hide the brokenness. The brokenness tells the story. And so what they do instead is that's gold. That is real powdered gold that they mix with glue. So you take a pot or a vase that at some point might only be worth a hundred bucks and that vase breaks. And now all of a sudden we're putting 24 karat gold all over this thing. If you were to buy this vase right here, it's on sale for $20,000. It's a broken vase for $20,000. And don't think that it's just because they put gold on it. You would be wrong. It's not just because they put gold on it. You know that there are professional artists who dedicate their whole lives to kintsugi. That's what they do. For example, if I fix that pot, it is not worth $20,000, even if I use 24 karat gold. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm looking at. I have no experience. But to an artist, a master, somebody who's been recognized at being the best in what they do, if you break a pot and you want to bring it to them, that pot now becomes a piece of art. The only one in the world like it. It might cost $20,000, but to someone else, it's priceless. They say about Kintsugi, it teaches us that broken is not something to hide, but something to display with pride. So think about your own brokenness. Sudden trauma chronic illness, the death of a dream, the loss of something you lived for, the loss of someone you love more than life itself. Don't put clear super glue on it. Don't hide it. Embrace it. Maybe you're in a season of brokenness now because God, the ultimate artist, is doing a work in you that he could not do when you were one piece. He's doing something in you. He is making you more valuable. I know that's hard because you're thinking of all the mistakes you've ever made, all of the bad things you've ever done, all the things you've prayed for, and the unanswered prayers, and you're thinking, there's no way, God, but just like with Megan and I praying for her job or the things that you're praying for, it's, it's broken, but I believe God is working. I believe he's taken this vase that might be worth a hundred bucks and making it something that's going to be priceless. When we read Ephesians 2.10, we read that we are God's masterpiece. We tend to think of we are created in the womb and people, aren't we just great? But what if Paul knew that wasn't just it? That you didn't ever stop being God's masterpiece the day you were born. That even through your brokenness, God the artist is putting good stuff in you, around you, and making you priceless. You see, unanswered prayer isn't something to rush through. 
Unanswered prayer isn't something to dodge or to skip. But it might just be the process of God doing his best work ever in you. And as I close here, I want to remind you, God is always with you. Even when you can't see him, and even when you can't feel him, and even when you're yelling at him or you're praying that you wish you would just die, we are promised over and over again, those same authors of the Bible who are brutally honest, who tell us all of these things, also never, ever waver in that God is always with us. In Psalm 139, verse 7 through 10, is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. And then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact that darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. So whatever you're going through, and maybe you have a list of 100 unanswered prayers or there's just one big one, don't rush the season of God the artist doing his best work in you.